Sister Mary O'Driscoll, in her article, Dominican Women in Today's World, talks about the role women like Sister Janice have had in bringing consolation and hope to others. She says, in many of life's situations, especially the confusing, pain-filled ones, the ones that leave us truly hopeless, women find it easier to be there, just there in the powerlessness, suffering in solidarity with others, available to speak a word of hope and of comfort when it can be heard. I believe this has been true of Sister Janice's life in ministry as she has carried the elephant in different situations. So Sister Janice, we welcome you this evening. Thank you, Anne. And thank all of you for coming here tonight. It's nice to see a full house on a cold, chilly, dark evening in the middle of the week. I hope that I won't do all the talking tonight. I want to leave opportunities for you to chat with each other and at the end sometime that we can have a dialogue. And I'll leave you in suspense a little bit longer about the title, but hopefully by the end of the evening we'll all know how we can carry those elephants. But I could hardly say no to this invitation from Sister Anne because of all my connections with Albertus Magnus. And the first and most important connection was, is my sister Mary Ellen McLaughlin. She was a student here in the 60s and she graduated in 1967. She went on to get a master's in social work at Fordham and for the next 40 years she worked in child welfare in greater New York. And I want to share a little bit about her life because she's an inspiration to me and because I think her life exemplifies the values of Albertus Magnus College. And I think she also knew how to carry an elephant. Mary Ellen became co-director of Good Shepherd Services in New York City. It's the largest Catholic child welfare association in New York. And every year they help hundreds of children and their parents turn their lives around. My sister contracted a fatal lung disease several years ago, and she died in January 2012. She continues to inspire me, and I know she's still present to me in new ways. She promised me, she said, I won't leave you, and she hasn't. Mary Ellen valued the education she got here at Albertus, and the friends she made, many for life, and those friends accompanied her throughout her long illness, and they continued to celebrate and honor her life. An article in the New York nonprofit press at the time of her death described my sister this way. McLaughlin was a tireless advocate for the rights of the poor and was an indefatigable champion for underprivileged children. Over the span of her many years in social work, she taught countless staff members the true values of the healing profession, so well exemplified by her life. Indeed, she carried many elephants during her rich and productive life. And I hope that her example will inspire other students here at Albertus to see what they can do to make the world a better place. And my second connection to Albertus is the Dominican sisters who founded this college and who teach here, and some of them are with us tonight. I and my sister had the Dominicans from Columbus, Ohio, now the Dominicans of Peace. We had the eight years of grade school at St. Lawrence O'Toole in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, four years of high school, and then I had one year at the sister college, St. Mary of the Springs in Columbus, Ohio, before I joined the Marino Sisters. And we are also Dominicans. Our official title is the Marino Sisters of St. Dominic. And we were trained by Dominican sisters. We were founded 100 years ago last year, and the Cincinnati Dominicans trained us. 
So with all those connections, how could I possibly say no to Sister Anne? Really? In my talk today, as Sister Anne alluded, I'll share some of the wisdom that I learned. It's actually almost 40 years on the African continent, and underestimated. More than 30, almost 40. And a lot of that wisdom is in this little book uh, that I wrote before I left Zimbabwe in 2008. It's wisdom that I learned from animals, from trees, from insects, and from great human beings like Desmond Tutu up there and Nelson Mandela. And of course, wisdom from St. Albert the Great, whose week it is, whose feast day will be on the 15th. So I hope to show how Albert and others tackle the big problems or the elephants of their day, which might give us some hints about how we can deal with some of the huge issues that confront our world today. You've heard that expression, the elephant in the room, which usually means we're ignoring the big issues and getting sidetracked with petty problems or secondary issues. And I suspect that each of you can name some elephants in the room of your life, your community, our society today. So let's look at the lessons that Albert might have for us. And as I said, having had 13 years of Dominican education, Albert and his student Thomas Aquinas are no strangers to me. Albert was truly a, one of the great intellectuals of the 13th century. He mastered many fields of studies and wrote 38 books. This was before computers, before even typewriters. How did he do it? 38 books over all different fields. And he developed ideas about almost everything. He was from Germany, but he studied in Italy. He entered the Dominican order. He taught. He was a bishop. He attended a council, a church council. After he died, he was made a saint and a doctor of the church. He is the patron of scientists, of natural sciences. And we know his feast day is this week. But I think that Albert's greatest achievement was in ch showing church and society that there was no contradiction between faith and reason. And this was no, under, uh, no mean undertaking at a time when the church was stressing orthodoxy and preparing to launch the Crusades, a dark time in the church. This was one of the elephants of his age. Instead of jumping into one camp or the other, faith or reason, science or theology, Albert mastered both the natural sciences and theology. He also adopted knowledge from Aristotle, a Greek philosopher who would have been called a pagan at that time, as well as he adopted knowledge from Arab philosophers from the Islamic world. And as I said, this was the time of the Crusades. So this was very outstanding, very on the edge at that time. And even today, how open are we to accept knowledge from diverse sources, to learn from our Muslim brothers and sisters? So Albert has lessons for us today. He was a person, this was a conference I attended, by the way, last year in Tanzania, where Islamic leaders met with Christian leaders and leaders of other faiths to see how they could come together to resolve the problems they were facing. Albert was a person who could reconcile what were perceived as opposites by others. Far ahead of his time, in many ways, I believe, I think he would have been right at home in contemporary discussions of cosmology and the new science of faith and evolution. And given my own love of nature, I was delighted to learn that Albert made many contributions in the field of zoology, as Anne mentioned. I didn't know that. That was something new I learned about him. As his biographer, one of his biographers noted, 
Albert knew and wrote about 114 species of birds, 113 quadrupeds, 139 aquatic animals, 61 serpents, and 49 worms. <laughs> and mentioned those worms. So he was the first to mention the weasel and the arctic bear, and the first to speak intelligently about the reproductive function of birds. Can you imagine? What a genius, really. I said, I wonder when he had time to sleep. Seriously, I do believe that Albert is a good role model for those who wish to build bridges rather than walls between those with different viewpoints and backgrounds. I'm sure that I'm not the only one who is frustrated by the lack of civil discourse in this country in political and social spheres. From the budget to immigration and health care reform, there is, I believe, a failure to seek common ground and to work for the common good. So now I'll get to the title. This is a proverb that I learned recently at a meeting of women religious in Rome. It comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It says, it is only by uniting together that ants can carry an elephant. By uniting together, those little tiny ants can carry an elephant. Imagine the elephants that we could carry if we would unite and work together for a common cause, whatever we determine that cause to be. Let us join hands like those little ants and we can do wonders, truly. And I do believe that the world today faces some huge challenges. I'll name a few, I'm sure you could name many, many more. The challenge of Islamic fundamentals fundamentalism in North Africa and the Middle East, gun violence in this country, global warming, growing inequality in income here and around the world, HIV AIDS, human trafficking. These are just a few. The list could be very long, and I'm sure you could name issues right here in New Haven that need to be resolved. So truly, I believe there is a great need for us to come together, to come back, to overcome some of these issues. And our next teacher tonight will be the weaver bird. Those are some of the nests. They, I believe, can show us how to be people of peace, a necessary skill if we want to overcome some of those big problems and face them together. Weaver birds, as you can see a little bit from that picture, build their nests at the end of very slim branches of trees, and they come up to the nest from below. <coughs> they do this in order to prevent their enemies, the snakes, the monkeys who go after their eggs, from getting near the nest. When those monkeys and snakes try to get near, they slip off the branch and fall to the ground before they can get near the nest. So I conclude in this little book of mine that the weaver bird does not attack its enemies, but outwits them. <laughs> and I use this as an example of creative conflict management. And if we're going to carry those elephants, I think it helps to be like the weaver bird. What is your image of conflict? <coughs> Just think about it. When you hear that word conflict, what comes into your mind? What kind of images? I see somebody going like this, like this. I think most of us, when we hear that word, we get very negative images. We think of shouting, of abuse, of cursing, of fighting, of bullying. All those negatives, abuse, misunderstanding. In fact, the word conflict, it's a good Latin word, thanks to my 13 years of Dominican <laughs> education, my Latin is pretty good. Confligere 
It simply means to strike together, to rub together, like striking a match. And that match, that striking, can create a fire. That fire can cook a meal, it can heat a room, or it can get out of control and burn up a forest or burn a house. So fire by itself is neither good nor bad. It's what we do with the fire that matters. And the same is true of conflict. The real meaning of conflict is simply about different points of view, different opinions, rubbing, striking together. It's very different. Don't confuse it with violence. Violence is about when it gets out of control, like that fire when it escalates into some physical or verbal abuse. When I worked in peace building in Zimbabwe, we used to talk about the most common ways of handling conflict as three. We reduced them to three. Fight, flight, and flow. Some of us, like the rhino, are aggressive and we choose to fight. We stand firm, we face the issues head on, and sometimes we counterattack, sometimes banging up against those with whom we differ. And in cases of extreme injustice, this is essential. I had to go to court last week in order to defend the right of the Marino sisters to vote in Austin in New York when one of the candidates for local election tried to move us into a new constituency because he felt he'd lose the election, he wouldn't get our votes. So he tried to move us. So of course we had to go to court and speak up and say we belong. We've been in Austin for 100 years. We want to stay. This is our home. And luckily with the judge upheld it and we won. So we had to be a bit like that rhino. We had to be assertive that somebody was trying to infringe on our rights. So there are times when one needs to fight back. Maybe not physically, but in ways, stand firm, defend your rights. Then at other times, we might flee, hide from a conflict like that in Paula, running away, disappearing in the face of differences. Often, this is important. When there's really physical danger, you want to run away from it. Those people in that airport in Los Angeles, when that man started firing his gun, of course you're going to run and hide. It makes sense. So there are times when we have to flee from danger. But there are those who, like the weaver bird, do not attack their enemies, but outwit them. So let me give you an example from Zimbabwe. And I could probably give you more recent examples from, from the United States. But to be honest, I still know Zimbabwe better than I know the United States. I still feel a little bit like an alien in the United States because I lived overseas now longer than I've lived here. But in Zimbabwe, I was chairperson of a human rights group. I think Anne may have mentioned it in the introduction. And that human rights group assists the victims of violence. And we were continually being attacked by the government in the media. They threatened, they raided our offices, they threatened to close us down, they condemned us in the media. And so we met and de debated what we should do. We could have fled. We could have closed the offices down, gone underground, as many human rights groups have done in Zimbabwe. That would have been the flight approach. We could have done that. We also could have taken legal action and fought back through the media. We could have bought ads, gone into the alternative press. So we could have chosen that fight approach. Instead, we decided to face those government officials head on. We decided to meet with them in person and explain what we were all about. It wasn't an easy meeting. I was one of the people at the meeting. But we dialogued. They explained where they were coming from. We explained what we were all about. By the end of that meeting, we were able to reach a compromise. They were able to allow us to continue to do our core work, 
assisting the victims of violence. We agreed that we would not run to the media and expose all the bad things they were doing because we knew other groups would do that. We didn't need to do it. So up until today, that human rights group made up of human rights lawyers and doctors continues to operate in Zimbabwe. Again, whether it's a result of that meeting, I really can't say. But that conversation did open something else up. And it gave us a new idea about each other. It was no longer this unknown, faceless enemy out there who had to be overthrown. They were now human people. We were human people. We knew each other. And that's what happens in peace talks. There comes a time when you need to speak to each other. Otherwise, you'll be killing each other forever. And we've seen both cases where wars go on forever. We've seen cases where people sit down and come to some compromise. But I'm, I would maintain that dialogue is definitely a weaver bird tactic. It involves listening, asking questions, rather than debating and making a point. And it's an attempt to understand the other, rather than trying to convert the other to my way of thinking. It's a form of respectful conversation. And we can do it each and every day. We can do it in our homes, in our workplaces, in our churches, with family, with neighbors. Albert the Great, as I said before, was a master of dialogue. He was able to listen to different points of view and bring them into harmony to create something new. By uniting different strands of knowledge, he was able to carry an elephant. Let me look, let's look at another example from the life of Jesus. It's that wonderful story of the woman at the well. And this is an example of dialogue between people who ordinarily didn't interact. Jesus takes a big risk. He goes outside the cultural norms and borders of his day. He, a Jewish man, dares to speak to a Samaritan woman. We are told that the disciples were amazed when they found him talking to her. Another translation says they were astonished. With this gesture, he cut across race, tribe, gender, and class. We are also invited to go outside the borders of what feels comfortable to us and to confront the isms of today. Sexism, racism, tribalism, and classism are still very much alive and still divide people. Let's imagine that that encounter at the well takes place between a Muslim and a Christian in the United States, between a Sunni and a Shiite Muslim in Iraq, between a Palestinian and a Jew in the Middle East. Or what about between a Democrat and a Republican in the US Congress? <laughs> or between call to action Catholics and members of Opus Dei? We can name many divisions, many polarizations. Can we reach out across the aisle and talk to the people with whom we differ? Can we ask questions, try to find where they're coming from, find common ground? Bishop Tutu of South Africa, who lives the message of peace that he practices, offers helpful advice on how to be people of peace in our daily lives. He says, if more of us could serve as centers of love and oases of peace, we might just be able to turn around a great deal of the conflict, the hatred, the jealousies, and the violence. This is a way we can take on the suffering and transform it. Let us watch our tongues. We can so easily hurt one another. Our harsh words can extinguish a weak, flickering light. It is far too easy to discourage, all too easy to criticize, to complain, to rebuke. Let us try instead 
to see even a small amount of good in a person and concentrate on that. Let us be quicker to praise than to find fault. Let us be quicker to thank others than to complain. Let us be gentle with each other. And now I want to introduce you to the buffalo, who will be our next teacher. And the African buffalo is related to the common cow here in this country, to the buffalo that roam the prairies out west. It is greatly prized in, on the African continent by big game hunters. And I think the, way, the reason it is such a trophy animal is because it is big, fearless, and dangerous. You don't want to get near a charging buffalo. And there are many of them. They travel in big herds, 50 to 1,000 animals on the African plains, large herds. But the African buffalo has a more endearing characteristic that makes it a role model, I believe, for us. Each clan of buffalo has its own leader or pathfinder that guides the group to water and pasture. The pathfinder walks in front while others fall, file behind, often in a single line. You'll see them walking for miles in a single line going to the watering hole. The leader knows how to avoid danger and how to find water and grass even in times of drought. Without a leader, buffalo would perish in a fruitless search for water and drink in the arid plains where they roam. The leadership of the buffalo, therefore, is not about power and domination. Rather, it centers on offering a service that is needed for the flourishing of the group. In other words, the pathfinder is a guide for the common good. The buffalo knows instinctively that each member needs to thrive if the herd is to survive. Selfishness and greed would destroy the delicate balance between the one and the many and would lead to the extinction of the species. Do you have a pathfinder in your life? A role model who helps to keep you on the right path to the fullness of life? Those are some of mine, <laughs> big ones, Jesus, Pope Francis, <laughs> and of course Bishop Tutu, Nelson Mandela, and I've met both of them personally, I've been very privileged. And I'm going to tell you about Titus, a young man in Zimbabwe, Albert the Great is another role model for us, and my sister Mary Ellen, and I'm sure you have many of your own that you can name. Our competitive and complex world, we can often forget about the common good and put our own individual needs and wants first. Success in our market-driven culture is often viewed in terms of wealth and power rather than in service to the whole. Our media often lead us to believe we can only be successful if we wear a certain kind of clothing or drive a certain car or even eat a certain kind of food. I mean, you watch those adverts or take a certain medicine, they could drive you crazy, you know, trying to induce you to believe this is what you need to have a better life. It's all about the superficial. It's all about image. Jesus offers a different model of leadership and success. Jesus calls on those who follow him to take the last places to wash the feet of others, to care for the poor and the needy, to strive for the building of the kingdom that welcomes all. Following Jesus' example, taking up our cross is what brings us to full life and success. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full, Jesus promised. Following him is how we do it. Titus, this young man in the picture, is Zimbabwean. He understood this message better than most. He's there with his wife and his young child. Titus lived on the margins 
of Harare, Zimbabwe. He was homeless, and he also was HIV positive, as were his wife and child. Even though he was sick and without a proper home, Titus had a dream. It was not a dream just for himself, but for other homeless youth. He wanted to acquire a plot of land where they could grow food, enough food to eat as well as surplus to sell. He lived to see 20 youth. This is how they lived before, in little shacks and, and plastic houses, sometimes even without anything to cover them. But he lived to see 20 youth resettled on a small farm on the outskirts of Harare. He died as well as his wife and baby soon after that project was launched. And he was given a hero's funeral by the homeless of Zimbabwe. What can we learn from outcasts like Titus? Each of us, like Titus, like Mary Ellen, like Albert, can be a leader in our own families, communities, and churches. We can help others to find the way in life that promotes the flourishing of all. Like Jesus, we can reach out to our neighbor in need and find that we meet God there, as long as you did it to the least of my people, you did it to me. I invite you back to meet the last guy for the evening. And that is the dumb beetle. I don't think we have them here in the United States. We don't have that much duck lying around in Africa. Those elephants leave a lot of duck. And the dumb beetle, I say, is a lesson, gives a lesson for us in perseverance. And the reason I say this, if you watch these little beetles, they get on top of that ball of dung. They, they push it, they play with it, get it into a nice ball that they can roll. They stand on top of that ball and they push it, and they push it to where they want it to be. It's where they make a nest and where they lay their eggs. But often that ball, that ball slips away, rolls down the hill, they go back to the bottom of the hill where they push it up the hill again. It slips down, they push it back up. They don't stop. They keep pushing that little ball of dung. And by doing that, they're helping to reseed the African plain. They are picking up the seeds. They're moving the dung around. And when the rains come, that's how the, the plains flourish. Tutu reminds us that we are meant to be God's partners in creating a more human and just world. This is what he says, and I want you to read it with me if you can see it. Let's read it together. God is transforming the world right at this very moment through us because God believes in us and because God loves us. And as we share God's love through our brothers and sisters, promotion of solidarity and active commitment to the belief that we can belong to one human family. And I think in, particularly in that area of solidarity, we heard ways that we could accomplish some of that. Maybe not perfectly, but one person at a time trying to persevere, 
trying to be creative when we engage differences, and trying to remember that when we are in a leadership position, that we are there to serve others, not to serve ourselves. And lastly, and perhaps pervading everything, is that what we bring to all of that, if we use those skills, is a sense of hope, and hope brings joy. And that's perhaps one of the greatest things that our culture needs, and I think Sister Janice gave us great insights into that. So I thank her very much for being with us. Our next Thomas Aquinas lecture will be on Thursday, January 30th, in the Be In Community Room in the Campus Center. That's not this building that's down the road a piece, because we need to use the stage. Nancy Murray will be presenting a woman, one woman play about the life of Dorothy Stang, a sister of Notre Dame, who was killed for her advocacy on behalf of the indigenous people of Brazil. I think you will be inspired by the life of Dorothy Stang and also inspired by the One Woman production. I want to thank all who have assisted us this evening, from filming to setting up to et cetera, everything that made it possible. And we hope that you will be with us in January for the next lecture, and please no stuff. Um, <laughs> Sister Janice will be in the back of the room to sign copies of her book for anyone who is interested in purchasing them. There's lots of Albert cookies, fruit free rose, cider, some donuts, so please enjoy and take with you. And thanks again for being with us this evening. Thank you.